Hello everyone, Kendall here, and um, welcome to the Analyst Hangout. I'm here with um, Dr. Nicholas Dodman, who is the professor at Tufts, Univers Tufts University Veterinarian and Chief Scientific Officer at Dog TV. Hey, thank you for coming. Hey, my pleasure. Good to see you. Good to see you too. Okay, so hold on one sec. Yes. Okay. Okay, so today we are going to have also as a we're also going to be talking to you about dogs. You know, everyone has questions for dog so We're also going to be doing that. We have some people coming in live that are also going to be asking you questions. And also, we have a goodie bag. And at the end of the at the end of the discussion, we're going to be having a winner who's going to win this goodie bag. And in here, we have a lot of things from frisbees. We have balls. We have this throwing thing, which a lot of dogs absolutely love. So, okay. Um, okay. Yeah, so stick around, and later in the show, we're going to be announcing a winner. And um, yeah, so here it is. You can win this and more. <laughs> okay. So um, first off, we're going to be talking to um, Paige from Houston. Um, and she has a couple questions for you. So Paige, hello. Hi, how are you? Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Um, so my first question is that uh, a breeder actually told me that breed that um, mutts are not actually any healthier than pure breeds, and that that's a common misconception, and that people who adopt mutts thinking that they're going to be healthier than pure breeds, it's not actually true. Um, and this was coming from a breeder, so I wasn't sure if that was a little biased or, or what the what the thought process behind health. Uh, concerns are with pure breeds and mutts. Do you have uh, any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, she's wrong, uh, I'm afraid. Um, but in fact, um, many of the pure breeds have specific purebred issues, um, not meaning to pick on, for example, German Shepherds with their hip dysplasia, or um, the Cavalier King Charles with a horrible condition called syringomyelia where they have fluid-filled spaces in their brain, their brain's too big for the brain case, or seizures in certain breeds and uh, other very subtle conditions. I mean, there's a whole bunch of things. Each pedigree seems to have its own particular issues. You know, atopy, which is you know, massive allergies in the West Highland White. And if you have a real true mix, um, these uh, genetic glitches kind of even out, and they are, generally speaking, much healthier. But Having said that, if you say a mix is just a mix of two breeds, and you have two breeds that both have problems, that first generation could have conditions affecting either of the pure breeds. So if you're a first generation cross, if you're a, a golden doodle, you know, you could have the problems of the golden with the problems of the poodle. So the poodle has seizures, and uh, actually goldens can have seizures too, and have hip dysplasia and hypothyroidism and you could end up with a mixture of all of them. But if you've got a real um, mixed breed who's like mixed and mixed and mixed um, so that you really can't tell what's in him, uh, if you did that genetic test, uh, the wisdom panel, and found out he's got about 16 different relatives, that dog probably would have a very low chance of having any of the serious conditions. So the breeder is wrong. Thank you. Good to know. Great. They're not all wrong all the time. No, thank you so much. Um, also, next, the next question we have is actually a user-submitted question, and um, it's from Kanimi, and she asks, um, why do dogs seem so interested in their own waste, especially feces to the point of rolling around it in it or eating it? So what do you have to say to that, eating feces? Well, first of all, um, all of it is perfectly natural. So, you know, one normal behavior of the um, puppy's mum, um, otherwise known as the bitch, is that she, oops, that's a bad word. But right. she, no, this is purely scientific. Purely scientific, but um, her job is to clean up the waste from her puppies. In fact, they don't even know how to urinate and defecate on their own to start with, so she has to lick them in the perineal area, and then when they produce to keep the nest clean, she has to remove it, and oftentimes that is by eating feces. So you think about it, your little puppy, you grow up and if you're learning any lessons from your mummy, it's that eating poop is good. Um, so a lot of them will eat poop. It's a perfectly natural behavior. It's not unhealthful. And it usually disappears, you know, by the time they're one year old. It 
might persist sometimes in some others. Um, but then the other thing, rolling and disgusting stuff, um, that's because they're, they're covering themselves in the scent of another animal, and oftentimes this is a dead thing. Like so a might, in a way. Mine will roll in dead things, and you know, they come back home smelling to high heaven, and actually they're very proud, and they've you know, shown each other, you know, see what I found. They brought the odor back with them. It could, it's a natural behavior. It could be something of a disguise, or it could be something of a boast. So it's kind of like telling their story about where they were, as if, look what I found, you guys want to check it out kind of thing. Yeah, when you think about it, dogs live in an olfactory world. You know, us humans, uh, we have like 12 million smell receptors, and they say that dogs have close to a billion, and a scent hound may have 4 billion. 12 million to 4 billion, they actually have noses that are more sensitive than the most sensitive scientific apparatus. So they live in a world of odors that we can only barely imagine, and to bring an odor back and communicate that way, or to disguise an odor, this is them doing what they're doing. In a way, you could also think the odor could be like a Harry Potter invisibility cape. Oh, so it also masks them from, say, enemies or, you know, other... It could be a masking thing, and it could be a boasting thing, like, see where I've been, see what i found. Mm -hmm. but we don't know, but what bottom line is both those behaviors are quite natural, and you know, as is, you know, paying attention to things that smell to us pretty disgusting, like horse hoof pairings or horse pucky. Whoops, that's another bad word. Yeah, you know, th these sort of things are pretty natural for a, for a for a dog to do. So there's nothing wrong. Sometimes you can have too much of a good thing, and people try and um, dissuade them. You know, so they do silly things like giving the dog breath mints to eat, or putting Tabasco sauce on on stool, which really doesn't work, and I think Mexican dogs find it a lot tastier that they way. Might prefer, they might prefer the tapas with sauce in the stool. <laughs> they might prefer it that way. So what we do for that condition, actually, is if, if you don't like a dog eating its own poop, which they sometimes do, is we just put them on a high-fiber ration, and then uh, it changes the constituency, and you know it's more like eating um, dry oats than uh, something uh, more pureed and tasty. Okay, well, next we actually have um, Arlie from Walnut Creek, and she has a question, question for you. Arlie, are you there? I'm here. Hey, Arlie. Hi. Hi, Arlie. I'm Mr. Dodman. Hi, um, how are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm good. I think I know where you live. Oh, yeah? You have the, um, you've got a rescue league there, right? Um, I'm pretty sure we do, yeah. Yeah, I've been there and talked to that place, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, Tony La Russa. What was that? Tony La Russa Animal Rescue League in Walnut something in California. Walnut Creek, yeah. Probably in Walnut Creek, yeah. We've got a big animal rescue uh, following here, I guess. Um, yes, sir. I just, yeah, I had a question about lightning and thunderstorms. We've had a few recently over here, and my dog gets really upset, and I was wondering if you had any tips to calm him down, anything like that. Yeah, I got a couple. Um, one thing we've done a study on here at the veterinary school is uh, actually two of the capes that you can use. Um, we did a study on something called the um, thunder shirt, no, uh, the anxiety wrap. Um, thunder shirt and anxiety wrap work in a similar way by, by pressure. Um, and there was a 50% improvement or re reduction of the signs. Um, I've heard of the study. They work. We, we did another study with a cape called the Storm Defender, and that worked even better. It was like 70% improvement in signs. And we even had a placebo cape that was a sort of dummy cape. And the dogs with the Storm Defender, which is anti static, it's got a silver lining. And it's kind of usually become kind of red magenta. They're kind of cool. They look like a Superman cape. Uh, I put one on as soon as I got one. I ran up and down the corridor pretending. But th those things do work. Other thing is you can provide a safe place. So it, you know, if you imagine if you're in the Midwest and there's a tornado coming through, a lot of people have a tornado bunker. And you go into a place downstairs where there's small windows or no windows. You've got music. You've got TV. You've got things to do, things to chew, things to drink. You know, you just go down there, batten down the hatches, you wait for the storm to pass. We try and find a place like that in people's homes, and we teach the dog to go there during the storm. 
But the last thing, and this is true, unfortunately some dogs who have it very severely, they will need uh, medication to help them through. And there's two types. One of them is a sort of background medicine along the lines of Prozac. And the other one something you use in a more immediate way. It's just when there's a storm, you can use um, a sort of an anti-fear type drug, which, we, which is called clonidine. So the combination, we can usually make some serious progress with them and, and prevent them from being so bent out of shape because it is a very serious problem and some dogs with that will actually, you know, if there's a storm when they're alone and they don't know where to go and they don't know what to do and their mummy's not there, they will actually leap out of a window. So somebody tells me, my dog jumped out of a third floor window, he was a jumper. But my next word is, does he have thunderstorm phobia? Because that's almost always the next word out of their mouth. Oh my god. I'm so worried now. Um, <laughs> So, so the static gets to them? That's yeah, we think so. Um, because the thing is, like, think of I had three dogs in a row that taught me this. They were all German Shepherds, and they all weighed, you know, in the 70 to 90 pound range. And all three of them, during the storm, jumped into the sink. And then the next one I had, I said, does your dog jump in the sink? They said, no, he goes in the bath. And the next one, does he go in the sink or the bath? He said, no, he goes in the shower pedestal. And then one stood in the kid's paddling pool up to his ankles in water. And then finally, the penny dropped. All those places are electrical grounds where if you stand in them, you would discharge static electricity from your body. And if you are wandering around in the, you know, with a big fur coat on, the equivalent of like an Angora sweater, and you have insulating pads on the bottom, you will get static. And people do get shocks off their dogs during storms. And I had one just this week. They said their dog's hair just sort of stood up all fuzz uh, with static and they got stuck shocks of it. If you're charged like a dog and you already don't like the noise and then you touch something like a fire screen with your nose, you're going to get a zinger right through a sensitive part of your face and you're going to remember that storm forever, which is why this particular phobia usually comes down in serious shape w between the ages of five and nine. Mm -hmm. oh, wow. So just protective blanket and to make sure to have a nice place to stay and also just something to calm them down would be wonderful. Thank you, Arlie, for your question. Thank you. So, Thank next you very much. A, so next we have another user submitted question. It's from Eric Murray from France. And he asks, my German Shepherd chases, chases shadows on the ground and no matter what we do, we can't get her to stop. The strange, thing, the strange thing is that she not only chases shadows, she leaps and pounces at them as if she were trying to kill them. Never her own shadow, but only the shadows of people. It usually happens when we have guests over or at parties. Do you have any insight on this? Um, so yes, my thought is the same thing. So what do you have to say to that? Well, that's a condition um, that I have studied quite a lot. And in fact, we have a study going on right now where we're looking for participants. I think we have all of the control dogs, normal German shepherds. And re you know, remember, shepherd, herd, herding breeds, mm -hmm. um, perhaps like yours. And they all have very high prey drive because that's where herding comes from is high prey drive and if they're all dressed up and no place to go they will jump at something that actually isn't the real target so it isn't a sheep or anything else to be herded but rottweilers will do it too because that's a herding breed they used to herd cattle in the old days they've got this desire to chase this predatory instinct that must be dissipated and if it doesn't have a normal outlet if they don't have enough exercise if they don't have gainful employment you know things maybe like uh, fly ball or chasing things, lure coursing, whatever, um, and you know, life is kind of dull, especially if they are genetically predisposed, which is what our study is about, they will erupt into this behavior. Um, you could argue that some of them may have it uh, at least augmented as an attention-seeking behavior, so you can make a neutral sound and exit stage left. Um, some of them, you could argue, uh, have an obsessive compulsive disorder which is a behavior that is performed ritualistically over and over again and appears to serve no useful function, usually stimulated a little bit by um, activity and energy in the room. Okay. Uh, and it, it's giving them shepherd, it could have a seizure base too. Oh, so just giving them something to do, something to you know be stimulated by, because that's just how they're releasing their energy because they need something to chase. So. So the two things, if they have obsessive compulsive, which is probably most veterinary behaviors like myself would say it's an obsessive compulsive disorder if it's beyond a certain frequency of expression. If you've got an OCD going on, in people you've got cognitive therapy and drug therapy. In dogs you have environmental enrichment and drug therapy and, you, and sometimes it's serious. You do need to use 
anti-obsessional medication. But you can try adjusting the environment and providing you know, more appropriate outlets for the behavior, but on its own that often will not be 100% effective. Yeah, my dog has the same issue. He chases shadows, and um, I'll definitely try that out. <laughs> yeah, that, and sometimes they pounce, and they bounce. Another breed that does it, which we're also studying genetically, is the Border Collie, and mm -hmm. they do the same thing. It's another herding breed, and they jump and they pounce. And I had one that pounced and banged his nose on the ground, on the ground, I on the ground. Seen. But his nose was bleeding. It's like he boxed himself in the nose. Because mm -hmm. he really thinks something's there. So right. it's, it's hard when they hurt themselves from something that they can prevent. So, um, But our next right. question is from Army Girl 1991 And she asks, I just adopted a dog, and I'm pretty sure he was abused because he reacts very badly to any kind of discipline. If, he were, if we just give him a small fussing, fussing, he thinks it's a game. If we raise our voice to try to give him a little pat, he freaks out and cowers and almost pees himself from fright. How can I discipline him? So how do you discipline a dog who has been abused before? Um, simple answer, you don't. I mean, he's had very bad um, experiences in the past. He's extremely shy, and he really doesn't need any more of the same. So he doesn't need disciplining. And actually, the basis of all modern training is you reward the behaviors that you want and you ignore the behaviors you don't want because the opposite of reward is not punishment, it's no reward. You okay. Know, so physical punishment actually is really detrimental to dogs and shouldn't be done and raising voices is ridiculous. I mean I think it was Colonel Potter in, in MASH said to Hawkeye Pierce, it doesn't matter how loud you shout at the Koreans, they will not understand what you're saying. So it's the same thing for dogs. They just don't understand what we're yelling them about. So they're kind of they don't know what to do, in a way. They don't know what to do. So you need to teach them and show them. I mean, you don't need. If you had um, a class full of children who had been through bad experiences, and you know, yelling and hitting and punishing and discipline is not going to really help them. It's better to, before you go into that class, read a chapter from or a verse from the Desiderata, and just be really cool and speak quietly and be kind and reward any uh, behaviors that look like confidence. Mm -hmm. And there's always, you can use uh, negative punishment, that is withholding, you tell him to do something, and if he doesn't do it, then he doesn't get the reward that was on offer. I mean, that's acceptable, but nothing physical, no loud voices. And I actually have a dog who was abused too, who was frightened of a belt. If I took my belt off at night, he would cower, so I didn't take it off in front of him. Mm -hmm. uh, if you shook a garbage bag, he would cower because he'd been hit in connection with robbing the trash, I imagine. And there were a few other things, but just by not doing it, he's now gained his confidence and he's a pretty normal dog. Mm -hmm. So just rewarding good behavior is basically one of the main things. Because yeah. there's, a whole, not there's, there's a whole school of training now, and it's called positive training, but in fact there's some people who still use punishment, and they call themselves positive trainers because there's an element of positive about what they do, but they're still using negative punishment based techniques so some people some trainers to distinguish themselves call themselves total positive trainers mm -hmm. and I would refer if she wanted to train that dog I'd refer her to a group called the Association of Pet Dog Trainers who for the most part I mean the, the, the essence of that group is that they are benign and they train with uh, kindness and by teaching the dog what to do okay no very helpful thank but you here's so much an example. If a dog's barking and you don't want him to bark, you've got two approaches. One of them is you can reward it when he becomes silent. The other is you punish him when he's barking. I prefer rewarding him when he shuts up. Yeah, because he's like, hey, there's a treat in it. I'll, I'm definitely down to do it. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So next we actually have someone coming in live. Um, we have Cisco from Berkeley. Cisco, are you there? Hey, Cisco. How's it going, man? Oh, sorry. Can you hear me? Yes. Cool. Hi, Nick. Um, I have a question. I have a mini schnauzer. His name is Scruff. And he can get, like, really rowdy when I introduce him to other dogs because he thinks he's a big schnauzer or something. Uh, yeah. So, like, how do I make him nicer <laughs> to other dogs? Because he's a total sweetheart to me and to people he knows, but when it comes to, like, hanging with other dogs, he gets kind of crazy. Is it sort of all other dogs or just certain type of other dogs? Uh, 
Well, there's one dog, my neighbor's dog, who he's good friends with. Yeah. But like all other dogs at the park and whatnot, like he just does not want anything to do with any of them. So when it's very broad like that, um, it's what we would call fear aggression. So something right. has happened to him earlier in his life that it may be um, lack of socialization. And I'm not blaming you. I'm saying this would probably happen at the breeders. It could happen in uh, the socialization period was originally described as the first 10 weeks of life. People now right. extend it to be the 12 weeks. So the first three months of life, if he wasn't actively sort of, wrong word, but aggressively socialized, um, that would be a problem. Or he could have had bad experiences, you know, at the hands or at the paws of other dogs. And in that case, he ends up by being a kind of canine misanthrope. He doesn't trust them. And being a schnauzer, you know, being a terrier type personality, he's not about to stand there and take it. So he takes the offense. So for him, a good offense is the best defense, but it's really a defensive type of aggression that he's being proactive. So the way you fix it is a couple of things. Um, Number one, if he gets tons of exercise, he's a high-energy dog, he needs to probably run his legs off for an hour or two a day doing fun stuff right. off-leash. Number two, you can sometimes make some dent on it by feeding a lower-protein diet. Uh, I mean, not lower than a dog needs, but in the spectrum of normality, say for a dry food, around 18% protein, not 30-plus protein for a dog with that issue. It wouldn't matter if your dog didn't have an issue, but if the dog has an issue like that, you can sometimes turn it down a bit. But then comes the master stroke, is a head halter. So if you use a head halter on him, you can demonstrate to him in a language he will understand, because he, would, he wouldn't understand if you tried to tell him stuff. He doesn't get it. You can't write him a letter. Um, every little dog like him, you know, they think they're a big dog, they've got a whole dog brain. Right. So, but you can communicate with him with a a head halter, and I, the, my favorite brand is the Gentle Leader. So it's basically a high riding neck collar around his neck. It rides high up behind that little bony bump on the back of his skull, and it's got the nose band. And when he walks up to another dog, first of all, you wouldn't stick him right in the other dog's face, but he sees another dog, he starts to act out a little bit. You just apply very gentle upward tension, which puts pressure over the mu muzzle, which is how mommy dog would communicate with her babies to say, stop it. And then okay. it puts a bit of pressure on the nape of the neck, which is where the mummy dog would grab a puppy to lift it from place to place, which causes relaxation. You just hold the tension on until he does what you want him to do, release the tension and praise him. And we do this three times a week, maybe more, and we see dogs change from being feisty and aggressive to other dogs into being totally malleable. The control you get is immediate. The learning on his part could take, you know, two or four months. And there would probably always be some bad offenders who he had an issue with. Failing that, the only other thing you can do, and I hate to keep talking about this on this hangout, but you can sometimes use medication to get an unfair advantage going forward, and there are some things that will make him a little bit more confident and therefore less aggressive, which are pretty harmless, and they don't work by sedating. So there are things in that direction, too. Is this more like a natural, kind of like a, a nuzzle? Something his mom would do would probably help out a lot. Thank you so much, Cisco. All right, thank you. Um, so next we have an act another user submitted question, and this is from Lou, and they say, my dog drinks a whole lot of water before he sleeps at night. Is that normal? And is that normal? <laughs> Drinking a whole bunch of water, he must be really thirsty. Well, um, what's really important is how much water he's drinking per day. You know, so sometimes it can be uh, an issue, you know, medical problem. So... And it's, it's not that easy to measure, you know, how much water a dog drinks in the day. You've got to close all the toilet seats for a start. If you've got more than one animal, that's another problem. Mm -hmm. um, but if you measure what you put out and you measure it in pints or cups, you know, depending on the weight of the dog, you take, well, I'm only talking sort of metric, but if a dog weighs, uh, average dog, 45 pounds is 20 kilograms, you multiply by, say, 60, 20 times 60, and you've got the number of milliliters, which you can convert into liters. That's how much you should drink per day. There are some things that change it, like if he's very hot and he's panting, or if he's having dry food versus wet food, you've got to allow for the water in that. But if he's drinking the right amount, it doesn't really matter if he happens to have a big thirst at night. It's just his particular way of being. But it, it could be the fact that this owner has gone out of their way to comment on the huge amount, not just going for a quick sip of water, but huge, sucking down the whole thing. 
it could be a problem. It could be who's an older dog or even a young dog, perhaps with kidney disease. It could be mm -hmm. diabetes of some well, sort. That's more serious than you think. Than we think. So there could be something serious, but it's the total amount of water per day would decide whether it was just a quirk or whether it was a medical issue. So the dog. Course, so what if the dog you, doesn't drink enough water? Do you? Um, I've heard of ways like sneaking water in food and mixing it with food. They'll drink more water that way. Um, yeah, there's tricks. I mean, you know, you put some salt on his food and make him more thirsty and stuff. But um, it's it's good to ask the question why. Um, first of all, because you you shouldn't really have to um, you shouldn't really have to convince a dog to drink. I mean, he's got part of his brain operates to tell him, you know, my blood is too concentrated. I need to drink some water. So I don't know, maybe they're feeding a high salt food at 7 o'clock at night and then he gets a wicked druth, they say in Scotland, where I used to come from. A druth is a big thirst. I mean, it could be, it needs a little bit more exploration, I'm saying. There's too much of a druth. <laughs> um, so we have another question. Um, it's Jennifer from, Jennifer from Dallas, Texas, and she says, what should you, what should you do when you come across a, t a territorial dog who is not on a leash? So how do you, um, yeah, how do you control your dog when there's another feisty dog nearby. Well that can be um, a tricky. Uh, so one thing probably not to do is to run because he will come after you if he's territorial. Um, fortunately a lot of the dogs who have issues with territoriality um, are a bit scared and once again I don't mean to pick on German Shepherds but um, German Shepherds and, and herding dogs in general tend to have um, issues with territoriality and if you just turn and face them and stand your ground with hands to the side, no yelling, no waving, no nothing, um, you know, you could even grab a coat just in case they lunge, take a, if you're wearing a coat, take it off and it's like a, a like a, something, if they did jump, they can bite that instead of you. Yeah, like a bull ter uh, like a bullfighters. Bullfighters. You, you really want to turn to stone. And actually, I, I'm not only the president of the hair club for men, but formerly a sufferer, so to speak. But actually, this happened to me. I was jogging, and out came this dog like a shark out from my house. And I saw him come, and I had a feeling his beady eyes were on me. And as I was jogging along, I kind of almost felt his presence. And at the last minute, I just spun around and made like a monster and just stood there like this. And he went, wee, 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 and ran all the way home. So just getting, well, what happens when you have a dog and your dog's on the leash with you, but you don't know how your dog's going to react to the other dog that's not on a leash? Do you pick them up uh, if it's a smaller dog, or how do you? Well, I mean, uh, this is irresponsible people um, who have a dog who might be aggressive, who is territorial, who's off leash, and there's leash laws everywhere, and you're walking along them. I mean, it's very difficult to do. There is a thing you can buy to protect yourself and your dog, and it's called um, Direct Stop and it's a citronella spray and it shoots out. It's a bit like a mace spray. Mm -hmm. So if you really have your back against the wall, so to speak, and there's an off-leash dog encroaching on you and your dog, you can always try spraying him in the face with citronella. It goes about 10 feet. So, so just something that to protect would be good. Um, yeah, it's like, yeah. Well, next we have Jono from San Francisco. There's a question for you. John, are you there? Hi, can you guys hear me? Yes. I can hear you. Hi, John. Hi. Um, I was wondering, I have a cat and a dog at home, and I was wondering, what are your thoughts on me feeding them raw meat? Ah, well, I'll tell you the, um, the end point of that story is that in our hospital at uh, Tufts University School of Veterinary Medicine, or Tufts Cummings School, um, raw food is banned. We have three nutritionists, uh, one with a PhD, all of them have DVMs, all of them are board certified in nutrition. And they actually explain the myths associated with feeding a raw diet that, you know, they, ha they, can, they can handle it because their stomach acid is stronger. Wrong. They have a shorter gastrointestinal tract. Wrong. They're carnivores. Wrong. Uh, meat is safe when it's frozen. Wrong. I mean, they just go through this whole list. I, I hand it out to clients sometimes. Wrong, wrong, wrong. One of the reasons they don't allow us to feed it is because it's not only potentially bad for the dog, but it's very bad for the people handling it. It's like handling raw chicken or something. If you went, 50% of all the chicken in the supermarket is contaminated with either salmonella or campylobacter. If you started eating raw chicken, um, you'd pretty soon get sick. I'm afraid I did poison one of my kids once when I didn't uh, cook the chicken properly on the grill. And, and your dog is just running the, the gauntlet. And 
the thing is, they may go for several years and just, it's like a Russian roulette, I'm being okay, and then suddenly they get sick, or maybe you're just not even realizing it. You know, your dog has diarrhea or, quote, sensitive stomach every so often. So raw food really, according to nutritionists, which I'm not, but I listen to people, who, not people who don't know, I listen to people who do know. And for me, if you have a DVM, a PhD, and you're board certified nutrition and you've researched the subject and you're a full professor, it's probably better to listen to them than the breeder or the guy next door. Mm -hmm. So they're not like their um, relatives, the wolves or anything, they can't eat raw food. That's really interesting. Well, um, wolves are a different kettle of fish. Um, first of all, they are carnivores. Um, dogs have evolved with us as omnivores. and In fact, they did a study into the difference between wolves and dogs. And what is the genetic difference? There's only one uh, difference that emerged in a study done just down the road here at the Broad Institute. And that is dogs have genes that allow them to metabolize carbohydrates which wolves don't have. So that the, as they've evolved with us, it's the same as us. They've evolved to be able to handle, you know, grains and carbos so they don't just eat meat. Um, oh, they need a balanced diet. Okay. Well, thank you so much, John, for your question. Thanks, John. Thank you. All right. So we, have, upset <laughs> so we have actually reached the point where we're going to announce the winner of this whole bag of doggy awesomeness and the Was winner is going to did be I win? well maybe that'd be no. a big one <laughs> okay so we have a drum roll who the winner is I don't know if you can hear it but the winner is going to be Hugo to dog so Hugo to dog wherever you are um, please email animalistnetwork at gmail.com and we will send you your prize with your address and in here we have okay so this is a chuck it which is like a thing you can do to have your dog fetch and not have to touch the gross ball and everything. It's really awesome. I know dogs get really excited about that. So many things. We have, what else do we have here? Ooh, we have like a bone, which is like a tree branch bone. And we have lots of toys and lots of awesome stuff. So please email analystnetwork at gmail.com to redeem your prize. Okay, and thank you so much, Nicholas Dogman. It was wonderful speaking with you, and thank you for answering all these questions about dogs, from feces, eating, to lights, mm. and um, just basically making dogs well-behaved in general. It's actually a lot more um, simple than you think if you kind of get in the mind of the dog. Thanks, Kendall. Thank you. Um, also, um, make sure you watch Dog TV, which is actually a channel where dogs can watch TV. Um, and subscribe to Animalist if you haven't already. And you can also follow us on at Animalist on Twitter and Instagram. And like Animalist Network on Facebook. So thank you so much, everyone. It was wonderful talking to you.